left off, we finished uh, the discussion of the spinal cord vascular anatomy. And uh, uh, most of the spinal cord vascular anatomy related pathologies that we are going to discuss in the next session after this talk uh, are going to be those that are being treated by endovascular means. And then we have a lecture on surgical treatment of these disorders as well. So in the spinal cord, what you have to understand is, since the margin for error is not there at all, uh, the choice of embolic material in the spinal cord is invariably NBCA or glue. We don't talk about uh, uh, onyx or squid or those kind of embolic materials in the spinal cord. When it comes to the dural fistulas of the spinal region, there they still have a role. But now, uh, since we are going to talk about the intramedullary problem, I thought that we will just discuss on basic principles of uh, how glue is used and how exactly you can control the flow of glue uh, till the point you want it to go. Because the moment you stop pushing, it will stop. Onyx is not like that. You push it to stop, it continues to flow. But glue, the moment you don't give any more pressure, it will stop immediately. So you can deposit it in a very specific, predefined area of the vasculature. So from there, let us start the discussion. Can I have my slides, please? Yeah. The principles remain the same whether we are dealing with a brain AVM or whether we are dealing with uh, uh, any AVM which is uh, present in the spinal cord. I'm just not able to make my, uh, yeah, my pointer is working now. I'm somehow not able to make this work. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, whenever you are confronted with an AVM, uh, spinal cord, brain, or brain stem, or any other part of the body, you basically have a network of vessels. And the aim at the end of embolization is to exclude the network of these vessels completely from the circulation, and make sure that none of the surrounding arterial zones, none of the surrounding arterial vessels are involved. They are all kept patent. So this is basically the aim of embolization, even in the spinal cord. And whenever you are talking about embolization, you basically have three variables. You have the AVM nidus, which is not in your control, because that is the disease process, that is the disease pathophysiology. You have the catheterization techniques, which is the most important aspect, uh, because this is completely within your, your control. And you can use your catheterization techniques to basically make sure that uh, you achieve a flow physiology of the kind that you want to achieve. And the third material, the third aspect of this embolization of these procedures is the choice of the embolic material, uh, which is again dependent on the kind of vascular, this mic is dropping in between, no, it's dropping in between, uh, which is dependent on the vascular tree that you want to put it into and the flow characteristics within the vascular tree. Uh, we have uh, known for quite some time now that uh, the AVM basically, whether in the brain or in the spinal cord, uh, is a ramification of the arterial end, which goes an anastomosis with venous structures. The AVM nidus is basically a venous structure. And then from there, you have draining veins, which ultimately drain and uh, uh, are also responsible in the disease pathogenesis. And whenever you are treating a spinal cord or a brain AVM, you have to make sure that this collector vein is knocked out completely. Because if it is not knocked out, in that case, you will definitely have a recurrence of the disease. Uh, these I will just skip. And I will just come to this point. In brain AVMs, the same principle can be applied even to spinal cord AVMs. Uh, we have not been able to do statistics of spinal cord AVMs because the numbers that we have are quite small. 
Uh, we have just around 40 or 42 cases of intramedullary lesions over the years. So basically, even in the spinal cord, what we have found is that the so-called nidus, the area of the arteriovenous connection, can be one of the three types. Now, this can be in the dura or this can be intramedullary. You can have a situation in which you have an arterial tree in the spinal cord, the anterior artery, or any of the vessels from uh, the surrounding areas, which go and get connected to the venous system almost directly. And these are basically high flow shunts. These are basically like the PL fistulae. So the homologue of the PL fistula in the brain is the perimedullary type of AVM in the spinal cord. So whenever you have perimedullary AVMs in the spinal cord, the so-called type 4 AVMs in the spinal cord, the angioarchitecture of those is going to be something like this. You do have another extreme which is seen most commonly in the type 1 dural fistulas, which are basically fistulas of an arterial system onto the dural sleeve of a nerve root. They do not supply the cord. They do not interact with the cord, but they engage the venous drainage of the spinal cord and cause congestive symptoms. In that case, we find that the main feeding artery, which can be a radicular artery or a radicular PL artery or a radicular medullary artery, if it is a spinal cord AVM, like the example that we saw just in the previous, which was being supplied by the ASA, the feeding artery goes and completely uh, uh, completely kind of uh, 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 arborizes on the surface of the spinal cord, on the surface of the structure that it is trying to supply, and make a plexiform network. That plexiform network is spread over a, a quite a significant area. And from the plexiform network, you have the area of the arteriovenous interaction. And then you have one, two, or multiple draining veins coming out. So in the spinal cord, this is most often seen in the dural fistulae, the type 1 dural fistulae, or the intramedullary lesions, uh, which I showed an example of uh, before. Uh, but in the spinal cord, intramedullary lesions, you most often have a combination of both these types. You will have a large nidus, which will have some fistulous components and some plexiform components. So like in the brain, even in the spinal cord, when we are dealing with multi-vessel fistulae, like what we showed initially, you do have a combination of uh, anatomical substrates, like you do have some part of the nidus being plexiform and some more part of the nidus being fistulous. This automatically tells you that the flow within these vessels, the flow in this vessel is going to be very high. When we showed the previous case, you saw that when we were trying to study from uh, the anterior spinal artery in the beginning, we could not see any contrast or pacification. All the contrast was getting washed off. So it is quite likely that the area in which the catheter was, was an area where you have a dominant fistulous connection. We subsequently saw an area which was being supplied both by the anterior spinal artery and the posterior spinal artery, uh, which was embolized. But that was an area in which, while we were injecting with the microcatheter, we were able to see multiple small plexiform vessels. So that part of the nidus was probably this, a plexiform part. So therefore, any AVM, in most of the cases, a significantly sized AVM, not a very small one. Small ones can be either pure plexiform or pure fistulous. But provided they have achieved a significant size, you will start seeing that these AVMs, even in the spinal cord, have got a contribution from a plexiform part as well as from a fistulous part. So when you are embolizing in this kind of an AVM, obviously the same strategies are not going to work for this compartment as well as for this compartment. You have to change your strategies. You have to change your catheter types. You have to change the concentration of glue. You have to change the blood pressure. So all those things depend on the construction of the nidus. So construction of the nidus is not something that you can change, but you can use it to your advantage while planning a curative embolization. Uh, I will skip this because we are not talking about brain AVMs. 
So I spoke about the nidus of the AVM. The second thing that we have to understand is how blood flows inside a particular vessel. Blood, is, blood behaves like a Newtonian fluid. And when blood behaves like a Newtonian fluid, basically what happens is uh, there is a certain amount of friction between the endothelium and the column of blood that is flowing inside the vessel. So you have multiple interfaces in a column of blood. For example, the outermost interfaces are going to be the endothelium to the blood interface, the endothelium to the blood interface. But as you keep on coming inside, you start finding that all these interfaces are blood-blood interface. Blood will flow in the form of concentric cylinders, one inside the other, when it is flowing inside the vessel. When it flows in the form of concentric cylinders, the outermost cylinder is going to be in contact with the endothelium, but the inner cylinders are going to, contact, going to be in contact with the blood that is flowing inside. So basically, since among the lot, the resistance or the coefficient of friction is maximum at this interface, the blood moves most slowly at the periphery of the vessel. You have multiple eddy currents because of non-laminar flow, because of friction at the edge of the vessel. But as you go towards the center of the vessel, the flow becomes more and more laminar, therefore it becomes more and more fast. If you were to be inside a vessel, in the center of the vessel, coaxially arranged with this particular flow, and you were to inject something, it will go much more further, because the laminar flow is going to carry it much more further. But if you were to stay in the periphery of this vessel, somewhere here, then the friction which is producing the eddy currents is going to make sure that the flow is not going to be as fast as if you were coaxial. The flow is going to be relatively slower. Slower flow of glue means more rapid polymerization. Faster flow of glue means slower polymerization. So you can automatically realize that if you keep your catheter at the edge of a vessel, if your catheter is not coaxial and it is pointing towards the edge of the vessel, the flow in that situation is going to be slow. And therefore, whatever glue concentration you are using is going to start polymerizing very fast in that area. That means if you are right in the nidus, or if you want to create a plug of glue right at the tip of the catheter, the area where you're supposed to be is the periphery of the vessel. But if you keep your catheter in the center and then inject, it is quite likely that it is going to go for a long distance before it starts polymerizing. So if you understand these principles, you might be in the nidus, you might be slightly away from the nidus, you may be in slow flow, you may be in fast flow, whatever the situation is, you can create a situation in which the glue will behave exactly in the way that you want it to behave. Same thing we discussed, the flow at the periphery is more likely to be turbulent, the flow at the center is more likely to be laminar, therefore at the periphery, glue will polymerize right here, at the center, the glue will go for a longer distance. Another important thing, when we use NBCA, when we use glue, uh, we, uh, glue is not radio-opaque, so we have to use some kind of a medium to make it radio-opaque. The most often medium that we use is uh, a non-ionic medium, uh, because the moment you have uh, ions, the glue will start polymerizing. So the ideal uh, thing is something called as uh, 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 lipiodol, that is linseed oil. Uh, it has a very, very low coefficient of friction. So what you have to understand while injecting glue is that a mixture of glue and lipiodol is less viscous when compared to contrast in the same territory. So if you have done some injection 
hands, with your hand, with your hand pressure, and you have fixed in your mind that this much amount of pressure is needed for the contrast to opacify the entire nidus, the pressure required for glue with lipiodol will be lesser. So you have to realize that, I mean, there's no way of quantifying this. If you press hard, your entire nidus is opacifying. If you press slowly, only half the nidus is opacifying. But if you use the same pressure for injecting glue, it will, it will opacify much more. So when you are working with glue, you have to be sure uh, and you have to remember that the pressure that you're going to apply while injecting glue is going to be maybe 50% of what you use while injecting contrast. So that is one important thing. Glue polymerization also, uh, contrary to what people think, we say that glue polymerizes within seconds. That is correct. Polymerization process does not get completed within seconds. There are three phases of glue polymerization. You have the hyperacute phase, which occurs in 5 to 30 seconds, in which you start having a glue cast. And then subsequently, as time passes, you have a secondary and a tertiary phase of glue polymerization, in which the cast becomes completely solid. For example, in the beginning, when we inject glue, and this is an ultrastructure of a glue cast from a vessel in a porcine model. What this shows is, in between the glue casts, you have multiple gaps, you have multiple holes. So it is basically like a lattice. But as time progresses, as RBCs get deposited, as fibrin gets deposited, this entire glue cast, over a period of time, starts becoming more and more solid, which can be 10 minutes up to half an hour. So the secondary process of glue polymerization can last from anywhere between 30 minutes to 10 hours, 24 hours sometimes. And then there is a tertiary process in which the entire fibrin glue network becomes completely solidified. And this is an exothermic reaction. It produces a lot of heat there. The temperature in that zone goes up to 42 to 46 degrees. So basically some amount of heat induced process of the vessel in which the glue has been put also takes place. So remember, when you are doing uh, embolization with glue, and at the end of your embolization, you find that you have a 5% or a 10% remnant, no need to go after it. Because whatever you are seeing immediately at the end of uh, embolization, this is going to proceed. Maybe you can bring the patient back after a period of two months or three months and then check again whether you need to do something or not. So that is yet another important point. When we have decided what kind of nidus we are dealing with, is it purely a plexiform type, like for example in a dural fistula, or is it a mixed type, for example in a spinal intramedullary AVM, or if it is almost like a AV fistula, direct single hole fistula, like what you see in perimedullary spinal cord AVMs. Uh, we have to decide what is the concentration of glue that we are going to use. What we have to remember is whenever it is plexiform, whenever the situation is plexiform like this, uh, like the top one that you are seeing here, uh, we need to have an embolic material uh, which is relatively dilute because we will keep our microcatheter somewhere here at this area, and then from here we will try and penetrate distally into the vascular tree. We will try to take out all these channels before entering into the venous system. So in this case, the glue should not polymerize immediately. Ideally, you are supposed to be in a coaxial kind of uh, orientation inside the vessel with your catheter, and you are going to use a glue concentration, uh, which is somewhere in the zone of maybe uh, 17 to 33 percent, very, very dilute. If it is more, uh, uh, if you see that the flow is more and the vessels are larger, you will go up to 29, 30 percent. If the flow is lesser and you are having good amount of stagnation because of wedging, you will use 70 to 20 percent. 
the moment you come to this situation, obviously a single solution is not going to fit you. So when in a complex, multi-compartmental, multi-physiology AVM kind of situation, if you have catheterized the plexiform part, the principles will be as if you were embolizing a plexiform AVM. But the moment you start coming into the fistulous parts, obviously, in this situation, the flow is going to be much higher. So if you try to use the same 17 to 33% concept in this area, it is definitely not going to work. So here, your concentration needs to go up from 33% to maybe around 50% for the fistulous compartments. The final type of AVM that we see in the spinal cord, the perimedullary types, uh, is the one in which it is almost like a single whole fistula. In this situation, the flow is very, very high. So you will have to use all your possible techniques to make sure that you are able to manage this flow, to make sure that you are able to control this flow. And then in this situation, you will use a glue, which is anywhere between 50 to 80%, 90% concentrated. So this is as far as your glue concentrations are concerned. Uh, preparation of glue, maybe we have some people who want to see how exactly glue is prepared. So glue, for preparation of glue, what we do is, uh, depending on the previous chart, uh, we first have to decide the concentration, the final concentration of glue that we want. And then we take the amount of NBCA and Lipiodol as per this chart. You can develop your own techniques. For example, if you mix 0.5 ml of Lipiodol with 0.5 ml of contrast, it will be a 50% mixture. Uh, for the simple reason that in one ml you have 0.5 ml of uh, NBCA. Uh, I use this table and with this table, uh, 0.1 ml of NBCA with 1 ml of Lipiodol gives you a 9% and then you go to 1 ml plus 1 ml which gives you a 50% and then you start coming down in which you have 1 ml of NBCA and 0.1 ml or 0.2 ml of Lipiodol which gives you 83 to 90% concentration in the final mixture. You can again develop your own techniques. Glue preparation has to be done in, ideally in a stainless steel container which does not have any water, any moisture, or anything which can give a positive charge. Because the moment you have a cation giving a positive charge, this entire thing is going to just, uh, uh, just going to uh, thicken and it's going to get stuck in the bowl itself. Then, depending on how much concentration of glue has to be needed, uh, we take typically one ml of each. I prepare with one ml of each, and then depending on what I need for the particular case, I mix it with a stainless steel uh, spatula, and then we keep the mixture uh, away from the area of water or saline, because even normal saline, the cation is enough to start polymerizing the glue at the hub of the syringe. Then what we do is we have to flush the entire catheter system with a non-ionic fluid, so we use 5% dextrose. With 5% dextrose, three or four syringes, we wash off the entire catheter. We try to wash off as much of the glue from the nidus as possible. And most important, what you have to remember is you have to wash the hub of the microcatheter properly with 5% dextrose because that is where the glue is going to come into contact with the uh, with the uh, cation, if there is any. So wash everything and then you are ready to go, you can start injecting. Uh, maybe less. Let me see. Let me see how much I used. I, I mean, this is just for illustration. So that is one ml of Lipiodol, one full ml. And uh, I think I used half ml of glue. Let me see. Yeah, this is 50%. Because both one ml has been used, so this is around 50%. Uh, see, I mean, this is exact 50-50% uh, mixture, so it is 50%. Uh, you, you don't try to adjust the concentration on this. You do it in the beginning itself. Because you will not know what is happening. Sometimes we do that. 
कि थोड़ा सा है तो उसमें और थोड़ा सा लाइपियोडॉल डाल देते हैं बट यू वॉन्ट नो वॉट कॉन्सेंट्रेशन इट इज सो इफ यू वॉन्ट टू बी रियली प्रिसाइज यूज द चैट देन वंस द ग्लू इज प्रिपेयर एज आई मैं यू कैन हैव फोर डिफरेंट कैथेटर पोजिशन यू कैन हैव अ कैथेटर पोजिशन इन विच योर माइक्रो कैथेटर इज को एक्सियल बट इट इज नॉट वेज्ड इट कैन बी एक्सेंट्रिक एंड नॉट वेज्ड इट कैन बी को एक्सियल and wedged it can be distal and eccentric and wedged so what i'm trying to say is if you use this particular situation in this particular situation you use a dilute glue when you are not exactly into the nidus maybe you have one last curve of the vessel which was left which you could not take but you still are coaxial but you are not wedged that means the moment you inject the contrast the contrast washes off the contrast does not get stuck in the nidus if you are wedged the moment you push contrast will go the moment you stop pushing the contrast will stay in the nidus that means there is no flow around the microcatheter which can take the blood further which can take the contrast further so in this case you release a puff of contrast and you realize that the contrast is washing off the avm nidus is almost there but you can inject from here also because you don't have any important branches coming off from this area so in this situation make sure that you put your wire inside the microcatheter torque it a couple of times so that if it is stuck in one of the walls it rotates and it comes off from there and then from here up to a 30% glue you can do a long gentle injection and you can allow the flow to take the glue up to its target so that can be done in this situation supposing at this area again you are not able to take this last bit of the artery you are not able to negotiate this last bit of the artery but you have a huge fistula sitting right at the end of this artery over here in that situation what you have to do is you have to keep your catheter eccentric you have to wedge it you try to wedge it but it is not getting wedged so at the same time the flow is so high that whatever glue you are going to deposit there is going to get washed off so what you are going to do is you are going to use the eddy currents at the edge of the vessel to make sure that as you inject your glue here that glue starts polymerizing starts making a thick cast and then from here the cast migrates further this is a very very ideal situation in which you want to take out the entire avm with just one injection uh, for uh, uh, illustrative purposes i have drawn a double tipped microcatheter here because most of the flow all the flow guided catheters are 1.5 french or lesser so if the vessel is slightly larger than 1.5 french Uh, these catheters are not going to wedge for wedging you need a more bulky microcatheter that is a 2.1 or a 2.7 french microcatheter so in certain cases of avms we take these bulky catheters so that the diameter of the catheter is equal to the diameter of the vessel and at that time when you wedge this catheter into the avm you have no flow going uh, around the catheter you have complete flow control and then depart, depending on the uh, on the nature of the avm nidus you can take long injections without any reflux so this is again something that we do very often again this is the fourth condition is a variation of this in which you are eccentric and you are wedged this is the best case scenario for a large pl av fistula or a perimedullary avm in which you have complete flow control in a very high flow situation you can use a 50 60 70 or 80% concentrated glue you can do one injection and you can finish off the entire avm in one injection uh, a word of caution uh, at some stage for example this was a very complex avm uh, this was a thalamic avm and you can see that we are in the posterior choroidal artery uh, in the posterior choroidal artery we have negotiated a double tipped microcatheter we have wedged so we thought that with this wedging we will be able to inject a dilute glue and we will be able to fill this nidus completely but see what happens when we start injecting the glue when we start injecting this was a 10 or a 15% glue 
Uh, the glue does not polymerize at all. You can see that now the black thing that is coming out, that is glue there. And you will see as we are injecting, you can see this, the glue is getting washed off. The glue is getting washed off completely. So a 10 to 15% glue most often does not work. So in clinical practice, if you want to use glue, uh, it is 20% or more. Uh, less than 20% glue does not polymerize very well unless you have a complete flow stagnation and you have maybe around 3-4 minutes to let the glue be there and so that it can polymerize and form a cast. Okay, so let us see some cases now. Uh, illustrative cases are of brain AVMs, but in the next session when we are showing cases, we will show you spinal cord AVMs also. For, uh, oh, that's done, uh, that's, that case is there. Then again recatheterized and used a higher concentration of glue. Because 15% uh, of glue I could have left it there also. I could have left the catheter there, it wouldn't have gotten stuck. I could have just pushed some saline, but uh, force of habit, you inject and then you remove the catheter. So they again recatheterized. Okay, so just a few cases. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, just imagine, uh, you have to just um, make a stronger imagination. Let us say this is an AVM in the spinal cord. Uh, this is an AVM which is showing you multiple types of uh, flow characteristics within the nidus. For example, this is the first compartment that has been catheterized that is showing you a very, very plexiform structure. This is a second compartment which is again showing you a very, very plexiform structure. But this is the third compartment where you do not see any plexiform structure which is appearing and the glue is getting washed off very fast. So that means this compartment is a compartment which is predominantly fistulous. This compartment is plexiform. This compartment is plexiform. So what do we do? First of all, we take off these two plexiform compartments with relatively less concentrated glue, maybe 30%, maybe 25%. And then at the end, we go into this compartment and use a very high concentration of glue to take out the fistula. How exactly we did this? You can see the glue uh, injections now. Now we are in the plexiform compartment in, on this side. You will see when the glue starts coming out, the glue will fill all the uh, nooks and crannies of this particular uh, compartment. You can see those small, small, tiny, tiny black, black things going up. Those are the plexiform parts of the AVM. So with the first injection, you take out the plexiform parts. You can see that on top as well. All these areas, the anterior part of the AVM has been filled up. Uh, then you come to the second compartment. In the second compartment, now we are probably in the fistula, somewhere here. So we will use a 60 or 80% glue to first form an initial cast at the tip of the microcatheter. And then as time progresses, make it into a bigger, larger cast which was not possible in this situation. And then we come to the third compartment and finally whatever is left of it, we fill it up again with a relatively dilute glue. So if you were to use a single microcatheter, for example, you can well go into this compartment with a single microcatheter and you can inject slowly whatever embolic material you want to do, but it is going to be painful because the flow characteristics are different here and different here. What you have to do is you have to first make sure that you block off the entire plexiform part and then once there is not nowhere for the embolic material to go, then it will start going into the fistulous part. So that is how you do this case with onyx in case you want to do it. So this was how we started. This is how we finish. You can see some vessels left at the end. These are basically slightly perinidal vessels. A bit of it is shunting still. We stop at this and we bring the patient back after two months or three months. We invariably find that this is gone. If this is not gone, then we can do just a single injection of glue in that session and that's it, the AVM is gone. Once, uh, uh, this might not be very pertinent to the spinal cord because the glue cast in the spinal cord is very small. So we cannot create a 3D, such a beautiful 3D like this. But whenever you're dealing with brain AVMs, whenever you're do, uh, doing injection of glue into the brain AVMs, uh, you basically have to look at the fistulous part and the plexiform part in the cast of glue. Then only you know that everything has been filled up. 
Yet another case, this was a case in which we had multiple plexiform compartments, like sometimes you see spinal cord AVMs in which you have multiple plexiform compartments. You have to go compartment by compartment, exactly the same way we do it in the spinal cord. You have to go compartment by compartment, and then you have to finish the glue injection. And these are all the glue injections, all the glue injections. And then at the end of the procedure, uh, that is the AVM, and this is what you are left with. So this is important in the brain, but it is all the more important in the spinal cord. Uh, let me show you one more case, because this will be again pertinent to spinal cord AVM embolization. Whenever you have a fistula, whenever you have a perimedullary fistula, or whenever you have a PL fistula, the situation in which you have very, very high flow. Uh, this is uh, a one-year-old child. Uh, he had a fistula. Uh, he had a huge, very high fistula. You can see that is the venous receptacle. That's a huge venous sac. The patient had hydrocephalus. Uh, what we do is uh, we put the microcatheter. Now, this is a flow which is coaxial. Now, when the flow is coaxial, everything is getting washed off. So in this patient, we used multiple techniques. What we did is we, uh, we fixed or we wedged this catheter onto the edge of the arterial territory. We also used uh, rapid cardiac, cardiac pacing. We paced this, so we got maybe a two second benefit with rapid cardiac pacing, and that was enough for us to create a glue cast in this patient. Uh, you can see the injection happening, yeah. Uh, that, is the, in, that is the position of the microcatheter, and this is going to be the glue injection. The first couple of droplets of glue just flew off, but then we were used to use the peripheral position, this position to create a big blob of glue here, which was just extending into the venous receptacle. Uh, you can see this is a rebar 27. This is a 2.7 French microcatheter. This is a huge microcatheter, the biggest microcatheter that we have. This, this was used previously to deploy pipelines. So we used a 2.7 French microcatheter to create this kind of a glue cast, and at the end of embolization, the entire thing is gone. So these are basically the principles. This is, again, a case of callosal AVM. This case we will be showing in detail tomorrow, so I will skip it now, and um, that's the glue cast. Yeah, so most important is just at the end of embolization, if possible, look at the glue cast, look at the super selective injections, and try to make sure that your glue cast is exactly a replica of the nidus of the AVM, and it has not gone into any inadvertent spaces. Not that you can do anything about it, but at least you'll know what happened, what went wrong. So I think with this, I'll stop here. And uh, yeah, um, uh, these are cases that we can show in some workshops. And uh, uh, yeah, this was the case. This was the case again. The same thalamic AVM, again, repeat catheterization again with a double tip microcatheter, this time with a much more concentrated glue, so we were able to take out the entire venous system completely in this. So I think I'll stop here, and... Uh, 3cc uh, lower lock, 3cc, plastic, plastic. Because uh, initially, uh, these, uh, that's, that's a very interesting story. Uh, initially, I was using the 1cc lower lock syringe from Medtronic. Now, what had happened is, uh, Medtronic wale hai kya koi? Medtronic wale nahi hai? Haan, bula ke lao, bula ke lao. What had happened is, one of their clerks had added an extra zero in the price. So I got a box of 100 syringes for one lakh, which was supposed to be for 10,000. Medtronic aa gaya. At one stage, mein bata raha hoon, tumhara jo 1cc ka syringe hota tha, lower lock wala, Uska tum logo ne ek extra zero laga diya tha uske price mein. By mistake. Uh, by mistake. Haan. Toh wapas toh nahi kiya na mera. Exactly. Lekin paise toh rakhi na mere. Toh anyway, that's how we started off. I got some hundred syringes from them. And that went on for quite some time. By that time, they stopped marketing it. So we, uh, got, we were getting one ml plastic lower lock syringes. 
in the local market, uh, nothing happens. I mean, people say that glue and syringes, they don't, but nothing happens with glue because you're going to use it immediately. If you leave it, it's going to be a problem. But if you do, then the one CC also went out of market. So now, and then it's very difficult to readjust your mental pressure because you're used to one particular thing. So we asked them which lear lock you've been selling for the last 20 years and you will continue to sell for the last 20, next 20 years. They said 3 ml. So now we use 3 ml. The medallion 1cc lear lock is available. I mean, now I'm adjusted. I'm very happy with my local 10 rupee syringe. So that is a 3cc lower lock syringe. Because lower lock syringe is uh, very important uh, during the removal of the catheter. With one hand, you can do it. Otherwise, if it's not a lure lock, you pull it, it gets disconnected. So with the lure lock, the lure lock is not for injecting. It is for removing the catheter, especially when you're using very high concentrations. So I think we'll uh, stop here. And uh, if there are any questions on glue injection, yeah, Dr. Yanish. Microphone, microphone, please. Uh, how far would you like the glue to go in each kind of uh, situation, like the fistulas? Dep that depends basically on the stage of embolization that you are in. If you are in a situation where one injection is going to cure the fistula, then you would want it to enter into the venous system, like it is doing somewhere here. You can see that is going into the venous system. Okay. But if you are in a multi-compartmental situation where you know that you're going to take five or four catheterizations, then you do not want it to enter the venous system. Because the moment you close the venous system and you have multiple open arteries on the top, it can bleed on the table. So the idea is to take the vein in the end. If the first injection is the last injection, you take it in that only. So always the aim is to penetrate as deep as possible. Whether you go in the vein or not, that's a different story. Uh, my second question is, uh, do you have any experience with uh, a balloon to control the flow in a, an extremely high We've, we've not found it necessary. Not with that. pacing and with all these techniques, we've not found it necessary, but a double lumen balloon can be used for both. Yeah. For example, that case which I did, uh, that case could have been done, the, the PL fistula in the young child. Yeah, this could have been done with uh, a balloon. Uh, we could have easily had a balloon, double lumen balloon here, Correct. with which we could have occluded the flow and done it, but it adds around one and a half lakhs to the procedure cost. Okay. So that is the limiting factor. If, if a balloon is there, then your life is very simple. Dr. Gandhi. Rebar, Rebar 27. Will flow in the Where will it go? Will venous go? system, a huge dilated venous sac, and then the, the transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, jugular vein. Pulmonary system and pulmonary artery. One or two drops, nothing will happen. Pulmonary. We have we have cases in which coils have ended up in the lungs. Nothing happens. See, uh, it will get stuck in one of the small branch arteries. Yeah. You'll have a small pulmonary infarct maybe a bit of chest pain for a couple of days, maybe some hemoptysis. But nothing happens. Glue, nothing happens at all. See, the total amount of glue that you have in the syringe is 1.5 cc. How much will it go? 0.2 cc? 0.3 cc? 0.2 cc? Nothing will happen. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, in, 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 when we use pacing, we don't reduce the BP. Otherwise, the BP can be brought down to 60, 70 systolic, 40 mean, 45 mean. My anesthesia team is here. They do it for me. Whatever I tell them, they do it. So we can bring it down to 40 or 50 mean. No, no issues. See, what happens is, when you pace at a rate of 200, the heart, the stroke volume is not like this. It is like this. So there is hardly any movement. So that's how that helps. It is not that during pacing, BP also comes down. But the amount of stroke volume which is being inject ejected, which is flowing through the entire circulation, that is very, very small. So it does not push you that much. 
whatever you're comfortable. I'm comfortable with pacing, so I use pacing. You can use adenosine, but adenosine again, after five, six seconds, the effect will wear off. So you have just that window. And especially in shunts, uh, that is difficult. I, you have to inject it directly into the heart. You have to have a central line. Peripheral line will not work. Have a central line, inject through central line. Pacing your on off is quite reliable. Yeah. Compared to adenosine. Yeah, exactly. You can, you can time it according to yourself. And the more, see, adenosine, sometimes it produces asystole, which can go on for four, five, six, seven, ten seconds. And you have no backup because you don't have a pacing lead there. In that case, you have to keep the pacing pads on. So, uh, I, I personally feel pacing is more reliable. Dr. Deep. While we were discussing about uh, injecting like glue, so you said that uh, first the dye through which you have a visualization of how fast or slow it is going. So that is a sort of viscosity. You know that you have that amount of dye, that concentration. So while you cannot uh, equate that with your glue concentration or something, in between you are also using 5% dextrose. Yes. So there are three types of liquids which are used in a simultaneous fashion. Yes. So one is the dye through which you have your visualization. The second is dextrose through which you you flush the uh, catheter and third comes the glue. So how does it like uh, the part where you were inside the catheter and not outside the catheter, so how do you uh, like uh, mentally or you, you calibrate that? Because if you are using a higher concentration of glue, like too much of washout time for the dextrose might result in a crystallization inside. So, like, can you just... Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, this, this you will learn only by doing. This is not something that can be discussed or taught. What is very important is, uh, the, first, the first step is do a microcatheter run with contrast, by which you localize your anatomy. Then, when you start pushing dextrose, you will realize that when you start pushing dextrose, it is very stiff. But the moment the dextrose is out of the catheter, it becomes slower, it becomes faster. It becomes, the resistance is much lesser. And glue is almost the same, like uh, D5. Almost the same, maybe more slipperier. So if you were to talk of the resistance, maximum is with contrast, then is with D5, then is with uh, glue. So this is the fastest moving. Like at whatever concentration you're using. Whatever. Because it is basically the linseed oil which is uh, giving the lubrication. And uh, another thing is uh, about the visibility of the glue at the various concentrations, because that is very important. We uh, in the pre in the in the previous generation machines above 60 percent we were a bit uh, uh, hesitant, but now with the new machine up to 90 percent is very easily visible. And you are almost always uh, injecting on a blank roadmap. And uh, now I have the luxury of having all four. Uh, to me at the same time. Okay, but I have for us who are not that uh, fortunate? Uh, blank roadmap. Because you have to be very clear about the angio architecture of the area in which you are injecting. You have to have a mental image of the angio architecture. So that when it's getting filled up, you know where exactly it's going. Otherwise, I will suggest do it on a conventional roadmap. Because against a white roadmap, the black glue, visibility is good. Thank you. For the spinal dura fistula, the, one of the common problems with injecting glue is it's uh, because artery usually the radicular meningeal artery are so thin, you want to penetrate your glue up to the foot of the vein, but most of the time it comes back. And how to avoid that? So that's the next lecture, Dr. Srinivasan will, so, will tell that's, us. That's good. It's good. Okay. Uh, so I think we'll uh, I'll stop here.